we come back now and pick up the point of the, the, the theme when we left off in our last study period and this to me is a very important point in regard to the application of both the Sardis Church and the Laodicean Church to the Adventists in 1902 let's turn back to the Bible commentary again and just pick up that statement by way of a length of our last study period and uh, I might mention too that I went a little into more detail on old ground in the last study period because there was a visitor here I thought would uh, need a little bit of uh, enlightenment in regard to what our message stands for so if you felt I was covering old ground a bit too heavily please forgive me good now we'll turn to uh, page 959 volume 7 of the Bible commentary and uh, in the statement we read as follows in the message to the church at Sardis two parties are presented and so it goes on and then Sister Wise says to the church of the present day this message is sent I call upon our church members to read the whole of the third chapter of Revelation and to make an application of it the message to the church of the Laodiceans applies especially to the people of God today it's a message to professing Christians who have become so much like the world that no difference can be seen in 1903 August 2903 was the review and herald date in 1903 Sister Wise says the condition existing in the Seventh Adventist Church was described both by the Sardis and the Laodicean churches both of them which means then that if these two things were equal to the Seventh Adventist Church's condition then they're equal to each other in other words the very condition that was faced by Sister White in 1859 in the Adventist Church was faced by Miller in the Protestant churches back in 1833 and on with 1844 now <clears throat> this is a very interesting application of these two messages and quite important I think so far as our present understanding of the unfolding of history is concerned in the light of Bible prophecy now I would suggest that uh, it's possible to make a number of dividing lines down through history for instance we have one that's commonly used before Christ and after Christ that is before and after his birth we have the, the dividing line between Old and New Testament history the cross again is another great dividing point between the past and the future but another one which is very important to us today is 1798 because 1798 marks the beginning of the time of the end not the beginning of the end but the beginning of the time of the end so let's um, like a diagram on the board to make this point tonight so here is 1798 and in that year the beginning of the time of the end took place so all history before that was before the beginning of the time of the end and all history after that is the actual time of the end which will culminate in the end Okay, how far the bridge? Good. We'll carry on. <laughs> Very good. Now, why is this date so significant? It is because, as we've stated before in the book of Daniel and in other presentations, I'll just make a, a brief allusion to it tonight it is because in 1798 we come to the end of the papacy's power to take away the daily cast down the sanctuary and trample the people of God underfoot that, that, that time came to its end in 1798 now we need to clarify the um, expression casting down the sanctuary let's go back to Daniel 8.14 for a moment and what we're saying there of course is very very closely related to the, to the latest sin message that I shall demonstrate in just a moment now in Daniel 8 verse 13 a question is put and the question was how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to trod the foot how long in other words how long would the sanctuary continue to be cast down by the opponents of God's truth and the answer verse 14 unto 2300 days 
then shall the sanctuary be, be cleansed, or as another translation puts it, re be restored to its rightful place. Now when is the specification, the casting down of the sanctuary fulfilled? It is fulfilled when there are no people left who support its presence in the heavens. That is today, of course, back in the days of... Um, in the days of Daniel and um, earlier prophets and people, it was the earthly sanctuary which was concerned, not the heavenly sanctuary. But today, of course, it's the heavenly sanctuary and has been since the ascension of Christ after his crucifixion. Now, during the Dark Ages, the sanctuary was cast down because there was not one single person left who understood its rightful place up in the heavens. Not one and therefore was totally cast down. But since 1844, Satan has never again succeeded in casting down the sanctuary because there have been, since 1844, people who retain an awareness of the sanctuary's presence in heaven, who continue to teach and preach his presence up there, and, uh, and certainly at this present time, God has a very loyal band of people, namely ourselves, who tenaciously hold to the view that the sanctuary is in fact up in heaven and not down here upon this earth. So it can never be said that, that Rome has again cast down the sanctuary until he has obliterated that truth from the earth for at least a period of time. And that certainly has not happened at the present time. It should have if the pattern of the past was to be repeated. And my point is this, the pattern before 1798 is broken at this point of time and is different thereafter. Now, for instance, let's compare the pattern before 1798 and the pattern thereafter. Let's go back to ancient Israel, for instance, in the days of the judges after Joshua's death and burial. And when the people of God went into apostasy subsequent to Joshua's death, what inevitably happened? The sanctuary was cast down, the daily was discontinued, and the people of God were put, were put under, under oppression come then to the apostolic church and when the apostolic church went into apostasy what happened to the sanctuary? It was cast down, there was no one left upon the face of the earth who believed in its being up in heaven what about the daily? It was discontinued and replaced by papal ceremonies and what about the people of God? They were trampled underfoot so therefore if that pattern, if that sequence was to be repeated after 1798 then when the Seventh Day Adventist Church apostatized what should have happened? if the pattern had not changed. Again, right, but was it? It wasn't. There never has been a time when God has not had people since 1844 who have retained their freedom, who have trusted in Jesus Christ's daily ministration in the heavenly sanctuary, and who recognize the presence of the sanctuary as being up in heaven above. And this, of course, is no longer true in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, by any manner of means, because in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is the daily ministry of Jesus Christ by which we are delivered from sin's abiding power is that, is that message still present there? The answer is it definitely is not. And in the Adventist church today what do we find has happened to the sanctuary message? It's gone. Even those who are loyal to the old theologies, the concerned brethren as they call themselves, only hold the sanctuary as a kind of a, um, a dead theoretical doctrine in which there's no saving value whatsoever much as the Jews held the sanctuary back in the days of Jesus Christ and so and so the pattern of the past has been broken let's praise God it has and because it has been broken we are now living in the time of the end the time when the Laodicean message is going to effectively do its work and bring out a people through whom God can finish his work in this world and that's why, of course, in Daniel chapter 12, the question was asked, how long to the end of these wonders? The answer being, of course, time, times and half a time, which brings us to 1798. And um, again, the question, how long to the end of these things? The answer, 1290 days from 508 AD. And blessed are those who wait for the 1335 days, when, of course, the great Advent movement was fairly established and the work of God was moving into its completion. I want now to outline the number of attempts God has made so far to bring out a Philadelphian people. First of all, we've, 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 rec we've recognized now that subsequent to 1798 and running down to 1844 or toward 1844, 
we have a condition or a church which is called the Sardis Church. And um, that took the place, of course, of the Thyatiran Church, which was the Church of the Dark Ages. And 1798 is a rough um, demarcation between these two church periods. I don't believe for one moment in making very sharp lines of distinction because churches tend to blend one into the other. As one is fading out, the other fades in. So you can't say, well, that exact year was the point where Sardis began and Thyatira ended. Now, with the Sardis churches we've seen, the condition there was exactly the same as would later appear in the, in the, in the Laodicean church. They had a name that they lived, but they're dead. This is true both of the Sardis church and the, and the Laodicean church. We mentioned that point in our closing study period uh, this, evening, this afternoon. And um, I'll just turn back to Revelation 3 again for the moment. And let's compare the other aspects of, uh, of this case. Now, in verse 2 of chapter 3, it says, Be watchful and strengthen the thing which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent if therefore thou shalt not watch I will come on thee as a thief and I shall not know what hour I shall come upon thee. Many times Sister White called for a return to the old paths. Now I'd like to make this observation today. We live at a time when there are thousands of voices proclaiming we have the truth, we are the people of God, follow us. And some folk, of course, would categorise us in being in the same situation. This means that the modern Bible student, therefore, has the problem of determining what is present truth for today. And what we need is some very definite landmarks or reference points to help us in that determination. Now, such landmarks or reference points are points where we have distinct um, confirmations from God himself through his prophets, that at this point of time a man came with a message from God himself. Now do we possess such confirmation so far as Miller is concerned? William Miller and the Advent Pioneers? Absolutely. If you take the book Great Controversy, I assume of course, and I know as far as we're concerned that we do believe that Sister White is, is a divinely inspired prophet and her testimonies are completely reliable, that um, from the book Great Controversy we have we have ample evidence given to us complete confirmation that, that William Miller was a man sent by God with a message from God for the people of that time and he came on he came on time as prophesied at the end of the 2200 days and the Advent movement began as a as a divinely inspired and directed movement back at that point of time now there are many folk today who claim to be Seventh-day Adventists but who are questioning all the fundamentals taught back in 1844. Now such a position is untenable because we can't claim to be a Seventh-day Adventist today and at the same time repudiate that which made the Seventh-day Adventist Church. If the Adventist Church was wrong, is wrong today in believing the two apartment sanctuary, as some people contend, not all Adventists believe this of course, if um, there is, um, uh, it, it, let me see, if, there's no two, if the 2,000 days did not end in 1844 and other, those other great Adventist truths, if those truths today are false, if they're a mistake, then what right does the Adventist Church have to claim existence? None whatsoever. And those who make those contentions, and there, are, there is a class in the Adventist Church who do, to be consistent or to renounce Adventism altogether. They can't, they can't hold a position today which is contrary to what was back there and still claim to be Adventists. In other words, the Adventist Church, correctly and rightfully under God's personal leadership, came out of the darkness of the Sardis apostasy, um, gathering up under God's direction all the great present truths by which the work of God could be finished. And remember this, that the third angel's message alone is the means whereby the work of God can be finished. Nothing else but that. God sent the message for that purpose and it will do its work. I, re I recall the statement in the Great Controversy to this effect in, uh, on page 390, I believe it to be. Hmm. 
and I'd like to read it right now. It's, it's a reference to the fourth angel, and as we know, of course, the fourth angel is the loud cry of the third angel. So that if you use the expression the third angel, the fourth angel, it in the end uh, more or less amounts to, the, amounts to the same thing. Page 390 in the book Great Controversy reads as follows. Revelation 18, which is the loud cry of the third angel, points to the time when, as a result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14.6-12, the church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel, and the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate from her communion. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world, and it will accomplish its work. That, that This message is the last that will ever be given to the world and it will accomplish its work. God sent the first angel's message in 1833 through William Mellon and that grew of course in the second angel and the third angel's messages and those messages were sent for the specific purpose, they were designed by God for the specific intent and purpose of finishing the work in the world and no other message can do that. And when one people descends descend, descend into the land of sin and darkness and loses that message then God will call another people to do what they might have done and if they too fail what will God do? call another people and always with what message? the third angel's message now let's assume for the moment that the message brought by William Miller back in 1833 to 1844 is suspect let's, let's assume that for the moment. I don't believe it is, of course. I'm quite clear in my mind that there was a message from God and there's a very valuable reference point so I can take what I believe today back to 1844 and check what I believe against that reference. And if what I believe today doesn't agree with that reference, then who's wrong? The reference or me? I am. Right? Absolutely. Now let me just reiterate the point then that... that um, I'll make this point that when the Adventist Church came out of the Sardis darkness or apostasy they came out of a church which did not believe in the heavenly sanctuary did not believe in two apartments did not believe in the investigative judgment did not believe in the 2,000 day prophecy did not believe in what became the distinctive doctrines of Adventism they, ju they just didn't believe that and if today we are going to repudiate the distinctive doctrines of Adventism and believe there's only one apartment in the heavenly sanctuary, that there's no investigative judgment, that the 2,300 days did not end in 1844, where's the only place we can go? Back to where Adventism came from, which of course was the Babylonian, Babylonian apostasy of the actual Sardis church. Now we made the point that the, um, that the Laodicean message um, is the gospel and furthermore as Sister Wise says in Testaments to Ministers it is the third angel's message in verity now while Miller did not bring the third angel he brought the first angel or the first angel's message rather and uh, if you've read Wagoner's book of Romans Bible studies from the book of Romans remember that Wagoner makes the point that in the first angel's message is uh, is present all the other angels because the first angel brings the gospel and uh, you can't add to the gospel so therefore the second angel adds nothing to the first angel but rather reveals the consequences of the reception of the first angel's message now when the gospel comes to a person that gospel never leaves the person the same as it found him. I'm talking now about the gospel, the power of God to save from sin, not just a theoretical presentation of some kind or the other, but the power of God to save from sin. And it is impossible for a person to, to receive, to be ministered to by the gospel, to hear it, without being the same, and, and he'll never be the same person again. If he accepts it, it'll transform his life, take away sin, make him a new man altogether, but if he rejects it, it'll harden him in apostasy. It'll destroy him. It'll 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 uh, change him quite drastically. As Sister Wise says, gospel truth either hardens or it softens. By way of example, in this respect, remember that when Christ came to the Pharisees, first of all, they were not such bad fellows. They were bad enough, mind you, but not as bad as they became. But as they heard the gospel day by day, as they witnessed Christ's miracles of healing, as they hardened their hearts against that ministry did that have an effect upon them a visible effect and the raging demons they were at Calvary is a picture of what happens to people ultimately when they persistently reject the gospel of Jesus Christ 
and it always of course will be that way there's no question about that so then the point I'm making from, from, from Wagner's observations is this that in the first angel of messages the entire gospel and therefore the entire message and the second angel only reveals the consequences of either accepting or rejecting the first angel and in turn the third one he comes along only leads us to see the ultimate outworking of the of the effect of the first angel message. Let me just summarise 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 this on the board today. We we'll come back to the Sardis period when the messages first began to sound, and as we know, of course, the people who lived in that generation had not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, just as John the Baptist brought the gospel to the people of his generation for the first time in their living memory, and so within those people, Babylon ruled. Babylon, of course, is the exaltation of man over man in the place of God and worse still, the exaltation of man above God. And any church involved in a works program of attempted righteousness by works, of course, is putting themselves above God because they're trying to save themselves by their good works. You may remember the point I made, I think, last year. I just repeated by way of revision. That when we kneel down and, and say to God, Lord, help me to overcome sin, with the idea of God being the assistant and we being the actual saviours, then we have so completely reversed the roles of God and humanity that man becomes his own saviour with God's assistance. And that, that, that is but to exalt man above God and to make man to be God, which of course is the Babylonian principle. Now, when the message comes to a person in that condition, the message calls for the dethronement of that principle from a person's heart or the dethronement of Babylon. And the person is then left with the choice of either accepting or rejecting that plea brought to him by the Holy Spirit. That's the uh, opportunities afforded to him. Now, if that man refuses to give up the Babylonian principle, what does he suffer because of his rejection of the gospel? He suffers a spiritual fall, a very serious spiritual fall, which eventually is followed by a material fall. And so... It is truly said of that man that he has fallen. And so the message goes forth and the second angel of Babylon has fallen. But remember it's only announcing the consequences of, of the rejection of the first angel's message. Now on the other hand, excuse me, on the other hand if a person accepts the gospel's power to overthrow Babylon from his heart so that the Babylonian principle is dethroned from within him and the divine principle replaces the satanic or Babylonian principle then can be said of the believer that Babylon has fallen. Certainly, it's fallen out of him or from him and he's now free from his power. So he doesn't suffer a spiritual fall, he takes a mighty step upwards. So then, the second angel announces the consequence of the first angel's message, whether the person rejects it or accepts it. It, 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 it answers both um, results. Now, the third angel goes on to warn about the mark of the beast, and to talk about the seal of God. Now what is the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast is the ultimate apostasy, the ultimate effect of, uh, of uh, enthroning Babylon, of preserving Babylon's presence within you, and when you come to the place where the mark of the beast is placed upon you, that is the ultimate result of the rejection of the first angel's message. Well, on the other hand, the seal of God is the ultimate result of the acceptance of the first angel's message. So, the entire third angel's message is all contained in the first angel. So when I say then that Miller came preaching the third angel's message, I'm talking about the fact that even though he didn't, didn't see all these results in his time, the, the actual third angel's message is in, involved there right in the very first of all three. Now, we learned from Testament Mr. Minister that the Laodicean message, which is the gospel, is the third angel's message in verity. So therefore, Miller taught the Laodicean message to the Sardis church. He, he presented the gospel to them and he presented to them um, their need to buy the gold, the white rabbit and the eye cell and of course he got rejection for the most part but there were faithful souls who did accept the truth and come out into the light. Later in the week we'll be studying the chapter entitled The Advent Movement Illustrated and the, and the Shaking from Early Writings and then it'll be very significant um, the significance of this verse from Revelation 3 verse 4 will begin to be noticed and here it says thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy and it's those few comparatively speaking 
that responded to the message brought by William Miller and walked in the light. So then, um, this was the first attempt on God's part subsequent to uh, 1798 to bring out of people through the preaching of the Laodicean message, the gospel, which is the third angel's message, a people through whom God could, or in whom God could produce the Philadelphian experience, and through whom God could finish his work. Now, if the people of that time who received the first angel's message had maintained their faith, had not broken down to the great disappointment, had followed on in the light of the third angel, then very quickly that would, the work would have been finished and this attempt on God's part, the first one, would have been the only one necessary. The only one necessary. And of course none of us would have been born. And we know the many statements in the Spirit of Prophecy which confirm the fact that um, long before 1900 the work should have been finished and would have been finished if God's folk had not been unfaithful to their task. Now when the first attempt fail, what must God do? Make another attempt with a different message? Never. He designed the third angel's message to finish the work and it alone can finish the work. God doesn't have two Gospels, although men have many Gospels, God has only one. And his Gospel is the power of God to save from sin, as you read in Romans, the first chapter and verse 16. So when God failed the first time, because the, the church uh, came out and at first, of course, made quite good progress up until 1844, but it wasn't very long after before the church began to sink into apostasy and by the year 1859, as we read from volume 1 this morning, the Spirit of God impels us to write to declare that the Laodicean condition had become that of the people of God of that time, 1859. Another important date, of course, was 1857, when the Laodicean message was presented to the church for the first time. And the warning was given to the church to reverse this stand and come out into the light of God. Now as we read this morning from volume 1 of the testimonies, the rejection of this appeal in 1857 was of such critical certainty that Sister White became so sick about it that she almost died. And only because of the intercessory prayers of the brethren, Loughborough and Andrews, was it Andrews? I think yes, that, uh, she, was, that she recovered to receive another message from heaven in 1859 to show that the that the work had failed. So we can begin to write down numbers here to indicate the various attempts on God's part. Number one, during the period leading up to 1844. Number two in 1857, and what happened to that attempt? It failed. Number three in 1859, and what happened to that attempt? It failed likewise. Rather a sad picture, isn't it? But that's the truth of the matter. Now, when was God's next attempt? 1888, right? And here we have another priceless uh, reference point because we are told in the spirit of prophecy, 1888 to 1893, over those, that five-year period, we're plainly told in the spirit of prophecy that uh, Wagner and Jones brought the third angel's message in verity. Now, why did Sister White say in verity? Why don't you just simply say they brought the third angel's message? The reason being that there were at that time, or there was at that time, another message which, which, which was claimed to be the third angel's message. And it was Adventism as taught by the Laodiceans. And remember we, we learned this morning that Laodiceans do not have the gospel. They don't have the power of God and the salvation. They only have left um, an empty, lifeless shell so that the living power of the gospel is not found in the, um, in the actual teaching so the Sabbath and the second coming of Jesus and the millennium and all those great Adventist truths are found to lack the indwelling presence of the life and power of God. So the Laodiceans then were preaching what they called the third angel's message. Now when Wagner and Jones came preaching what was the third angel's message, the message in verity, the Laodiceans said to Sister White, what are these men preaching? And what was her reply? This is the third angel's message in verity. In other words, between the two, the one that you've got and the one that these men bring, the one that they bring is the real thing, not the other. And of course, appearance-wise, 
We might say there's very little difference because Laodicean Adventism believes in the Sabbath, the second coming of Christ, the 2,200 days, the, the two apartment sanctuary, and all these great fundamental Adventist truths. Do Wagner and Jones believe in all those same truths? Absolutely. Do we today believe in those same truths? Certainly we do. But uh, as I mentioned this morning, of course, the Laodicean Adventism recognised that there was a vast that the difference between what they taught and what Wagner and Jones brought was so great that the two of them could never ever get along together. There's no better possibility than for Isaac and Ishmael to live together than there was for Laodicean Adventism and the real Adventism to abide together. Now, I said before early in the study period that uh, we face the problem today of so many voices around each of which says we've got the truth, we've got the truth, we've got the truth prophesied of course in the spirit of prophecy in fact Sister White foresaw this exact situation as we have it today and wrote about it in volume 5 of the testimonies let me just read the statement here on page 80 of testimonies volume 5 here are the words the days are fast approaching when there will be great perplexity and confusion. Satan, clothed in angel robes, will deceive if possible the very elect. There will be God's many and Lord's many. Every wind of doctrine will be blowing. Those who have rendered supreme homage to science falsely so-called will not be the leaders then and so on. The part I wish to remark on is the fact that we're warned, we were warned that... Uh, in the future from Sister White's day there would be God's many and Lord's many every wind of doctrine blowing and that is absolutely true at the present time never have there been so many different voices proclaiming that they each one that each one has the truth for this time and so we need reference points we need to be able to go back to some some spot where we can measure the message of today and ask is this that I teach and believe what was taught at that measuring point in the past as I said before William Miller's day was one and the message of Wagner and Jones received a divine endorsement. Sister White gave her unqualified support to what those men taught and said, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. I remember reading that statement away back in about 1954 or 5, and when I read it I said, I said to myself, instantly said to myself, if that message came from God, I want it. No matter what the cost may be, I want it. And... I then went to work to find it. I read their books and I was not content until I had made an into my own experience what those men wrote about. I was sad to see though that uh, while others around me also said the same thing to start with, when they found there was a cost involved, the cost of friends, reputation, position, even church membership, that they said the cost is too high, we'd rather have what we got than to have the truth. And they rationalised of course that it was the truth anyway. Now, let me say it again, 1844 is a reference point, 1880 is another reference point, so if we take what we believe back to those places and measure what we now believe with what those men taught, Wagner and Jones and William Miller, and if we find that what we believe today is in perfect harmony, then what can we be assured of? That we do have the truth of God. Absolutely. And I have been very... Uh, grateful for uh, some witnesses lately which have testified to the fact that what we do teach is in fact in perfect harmony with Wagner and Jones and of course with William Miller as well I am one person who carries a very deep concern lest I be a teacher of deadly error that's the last thing I want to be I'm well aware of the fact that in the book Great Controversy we were warned that in the last times those who have been teachers of error and thus led their heroes astray will be torn apart limb from limb by the, by the infuriated people who were once their devoted parishioners. And that just isn't worth it. It means the loss of eternal life plus um, a very unhappy end of that nature. And so these reference points to me are very, very important. And when I've received two or three letters lately from various individuals who have read Wagner and Jones and the books which we have written, and they say that they find nothing but perfect harmony between the two, that is very reassuring so the least of it, very reassuring and that's the way it should be of course and I fail to understand how modern Adventists can disregard those reference points and, and start coming up with a new Adventism which is not Adventism at all now as we know of course when God made the attempt in 1888 to um, bring about a great reformation through the presentation of the Laodicean message what again was the result? failure not because of God's weakness, because God is not weak, 
But because God does not compel men to believe, because the decision as to what they believe rests with them, and because by this time Laodiceanism has such a blinding grip upon the minds of the Adventist world that they could not, or I shouldn't say they could not, but they would not, uh, submit to the entreaties of God and, and, and work at making great changes in their lives. Rather, they, they were much happier with rejection and fighting against the truth of God at that time. Now, I plan to make quite a few comments later on the fact that Jesus Christ is the true witness. I mentioned already, of course, that um, Christ is presented to each church in a, in a way which best suits the needs of that church. And to the lay of the sins is called the true witness, the one who never tells a lie. And uh, if there's one thing the lay of the sin church does need, it is a true witness so that they can really see themselves through the eyes of another, namely Jesus Christ, who never tells a lie because he is in himself the truth. And the only safe course for the lay of the sins to, to have adopted is to have said, well, the true witness says that we are wretched, miserable, poor and blind and naked. We can't see it, but he says it, so if he says it must be true. He has also offered us the gold, the white ramen and the eye salve. We don't see our need of these things because we think we're rich and increased with goods. So they should have honestly recognized the difference between their own false witness and the true witness as made by Jesus Christ himself. And then... Recognizing that God is the perfect problem solver, they ought to have knelt down and said, Now, Lord, you say it is so. We can't see it. But because you say it, it is true, we believe that much. Now, we plead with you to open our eyes to see, for ourselves, see ourselves as you see us. And if they had taken that humble position, of course, and spent a lot of time in agonizing prayer, struggling for the mastery, history would have been written very, very differently. Now then, when in 1888 to 1893 the Lord failed because of the perversity of his people and their blindness and stubbornness, the hardness of heart to use such the right exact words, when that attempt failed, what must God do again? He must try once more. Okay? And when he tries once more, once again, what will be the means God will introduce to finish the work? The presentation of the third angel's message in verity let me stress the point there is no other message to which God will finish the work and that was the truth back in 44 it was the truth in 1857 1859 and here in 1888 1893 and it is still the truth today and nothing will ever change the faith of the truth and it will do its work now we're well aware of course that quite a number of decades went by before um, before the time came that uh, the recovery of the lost light was achieved. We remember that um, the books of Wagner and Jones were stripped from college libraries. You couldn't find those books anywhere. As I mentioned earlier, I've always been a very interested student of church history and was well versed in the stories of Loughborough and Bates and James Nolan White and William Miller, Fitz, Litch, Stowe and so forth. But I never ever came across a single reference to Wagner and Jones until the recovery of their lost message. And that to me is one of the most powerful witnesses to the fact that uh, a, a very definite attempt was made to hide that message away out of sight. But in 1915, through history too long to tell at this moment, I'll tell that later, there began the rediscovery of the writings of Wagner and Jones and wherever those books were read with interest and uh, open-mindedness, they began to work reformations and re or revivals and reformations in the lives of those who read them. And history continued to be made uh, when, when this took place. Now this time, <coughs> pardon me, this time fortunately, around the world there were individuals here and there who were prepared to honestly evaluate the messages God gave and to believe God's word when he said, to believe the truth with us when he said that God has sent the most precious message to those, through those two men. Now, we have to face the fact, we, we, we know today, of course, that we are the people who are dedicated to believing that message as God gave it. Not as, we might, not as we might think it should be, but as God gave it. To recognize 44 and 1888 as reference points, measuring points where we can check what we believe today. And we're dedicated to preaching that message as God gave it, not just in theory, but also in practice and in power. 
So it, it remains in us as a living, transforming agency to fit us to be God's instruments in the last great work. But remember that we are frail the human beings like all those who have gone before us. When we, read, when we look at our own weaknesses and frail, frailties and compare them with those of da David or Solomon or Moses or Abraham, then don't you tremble for fear that we'll also fall in the same pathway that they went. Now, is it possible that we shall fail? Absolutely. That is very, very highly possible. And we must never, ever come to the place where we think that we are God's people simply because he called us. We remain as God's people only by being faithful to his truth. And no greater mistake can ever be made by a people than to imagine that because they were, com they were commissioned to do a work, that that commission is unconditionally theirs till the end of time. That's, that's a sad mistake made by the Jews, the Roman Catholics and other churches as well. Now, if we should fail, and there is that possibility, may it never be, of course, but if we should fail, then what, God, what, what must God do? Wait till another time, another place, another people, and through them do what he desired to do through us, and in fact desired to do through others before us, but could not because of their unbelief and hardness of hearts. Now, <clears throat> Obviously, of course, this, this now demonstrates the relationship between the various attempts God has made down to number five of the present. In fact, you might read the testimony and find another one or two in between here where God gave cause, but, um, and that would make maybe six or seven times at the present, up to the present moment. But let's, let's know this, that when God finds a people who will learn the lessons from the past, who will be faithful to his truth, no matter how small our people may be, through them he will finish the work. Provided we retain with unswerving faithfulness the great truths which God has given to us as he gave them not with, not with human inventions and ideas but as God gave those truths if we stand by those pillars of the faith in the past we are very much of course on safe ground tomorrow morning we'll continue this theme by looking at, in this, at this in more detail but for now our time has gone so we'll close at this point Yeah, uh, 90, yeah, right, 1950 on. 1950. Yeah, up till the present time. It started 1950 when Will, Will and Short began their representations to the General Conference and uh, got their interesting answers. Yeah, I thought I had a hymnal here one time.